I stood every day in a courthouse researching records in libraries, um, in town offices. And now what I do is all on the computer. And I'm now um, competing against people in, in India um, for the same work. And you know my work is being outsourced. I no longer get the calls from California or Boston. So I have that to bring to Boston, is that I'm a small business owner. I know what it is to recreate yourself, change with the economy. But also, we have to stop looking our, at ourselves as just Amherst, Grandy, or Pelham. We need to think of ourselves as a bigger district, work with our cities of Holyoke. Mayor Morris is doing a lot of amazing things in, the whole, in Holyoke, bringing jobs, and those businesses will bring in more workers, those workers will look for more housing, and we have to be ready here in Amherst to welcome those workers and the offshoots of those businesses and their needs also. But also, the foreclosure crisis is blighting our cities. Who wants to move to Springfield and Holyoke? We have to deal with this crisis. It's robbing our cities and towns from tax money. One of these days, you know, the bank is going to forget to pay their taxes. We have to really think of the foreclosure crisis on a statewide level. It's causing a lot of people to move out of the, uh, move out of the state. And our cities, who wants our businesses, who wants to move to Springfield and Holyoke with the foreclosure crisis, uh, the burnt out buildings. So we have to think of this as a region and bring jobs not just to Amherst, but to the whole Pioneer Valley area. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Yeah, I think even though it's absolutely undeniable that there's, there are significant um, economic inequalities between regions in the Commonwealth, uh, part of my experience in the last 10 years is to really get a sense of just how dynamic this region is and how much opportunity is there, there potential, and I'd say latent potential, for a um, lot of better jobs, uh, significant business expansion and attachments that go with that. I th and we look at UMass, the research they're doing there. If you look at um, the, uh, the rebound of manufacturing, the fact that manufacturing jobs are actually no longer declining. We're now onshoring manufacturing jobs instead of losing them. Um, there's a lot of potential here in the Valley, and I, I completely agree, by the way, about thinking regionally instead of um, uh, just town by town and, and sort of uh, fighting your neighbors for growth. Um, but I think the, the basics of it are expanding infrastructure, investments, stabilizing municipal finance so that you can plan uh, better ahead. Um, properly supporting public education and expanding and, and eliminating the war essentially between charters and public education. I think more broadly than that, we have to expand and stabilize support for the inner city of Massachusetts to make sure it has the resources uh, that it needs to be able to grow and thrive as a center of innovation, especially when you see things like Mass Mutual moving to the town in Amherst because of the excellence that's at the university. Um, and I think beyond that, there are other things like the Land Use Reform Act that frankly could enable and facilitate better development uh, locally that could be advocated for in a state house. The other question you asked though is about income inequality. And I think there we really have to very significantly address both the cost of housing and its affordability, both for uh, low income families as well as also uh, workforce housing. Uh, that has something to do with zoning, but also about funding and other incentives you can provide. Same thing with student indebtedness, which I think if you look at overall economic security people have, uh, we need to significantly reduce student debt burdens and the cost of education as well. Uh, and then also, frankly, think about retirement security and be much more creative about ways in which at a state level we can expand opportunities for families to save for their own retirements independent of an individual job. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have a two-part approach. I think I'm in line with my opponents for this race that we'll, we will do everything we can to advocate for the institutions that are effectively our local industry, uh, higher education. Uh, I'm certain that we will do everything we can to uh, guarantee consistent funding, make sure that the state abides by the 50-50 deal where uh, they increase, the state increases its investment in the university, uh, and then stand by that, and it put a freeze on tuition and fees that students are paying. 
uh, and really makes this a, a public institution and not, unfortunately, what's happened, I would say, over the last 30 years, which is a public institution that's almost privatized. But I also have, I have, I think, this is where I'll differentiate, I have a more theoretical answer. Uh, I'll go economic on this. I'm a Keynesian. And Keynesian economics believes that uh, the best economy is the one that pays the closest attention to the demand side of the market. And so I'm a supporter of doing anything and everything that we can to uh, get boost the incomes of working class and middle class people. And that could be through, as I mentioned earlier, a higher minimum wage, improved organizing rights, better access to public, high, uh, public education, pre-K, through at least community college, investment in infrastructure, and investment in all sorts of safety net programs that will help boost those incomes. And I'll also take it a step further. We need to have some sort of progressive taxes in this commonwealth to do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I think this is a good segue into the next set of questions around education policy. So let's start with some questions about uh, higher education policy. Uh, the first is, uh, what would the candidates, do, what, would, what do the candidates think is required to ensure that the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and other state institutions maintain their excellence while also continuing to provide opportunities to students of the Commonwealth, uh, particularly low-income students and students of color? So we'll uh, start with that. May I? Sure. Thank you. So um, the, the millionaire's tax, right, will bring in about $2 billion annually, and that's what is recommended um, by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, which I'm a member of. Um, it's also recommended by you know, a number of, of labor and progressive community organizations. So we need to do that. We need to be able to fully fund public education we do not need to burden our students with debt after they graduate. You know, I think that school should be about opportunities and no one should be concerned about that type of, of burden. And as a public uh, flagship, you know, public, public education should be free for all and it should be made available um, and accessible to all. So, um, so that, that would be, I think, a primary driver to make, to make that happen, to, to fully fund those mandates. Um, our, uh, I talked to Chancellor uh, Subhashwami not too long ago, and he mentioned you know, the buildings that are you know, um, being renovated now or, or being built here on this campus, but it requires funding to pay um, for that debt. So we need to, to address that and, and to um, maintain this, the world-class you know, education that, that the university is, is recognized for. Anybody else want to speak to that question? Sure. I also support this millionaire tax fair share amendment. It would increase the tax at uh, 4% on incomes over a million dollars statewide. <coughs> much about good education. That's a key step. Another thing for UMass in particular is it, tuition has stayed the same for years and years and years, but fees keep going up and up and up. So making sure that fees are staying the same or going down preferably. Um, obviously, student debt, we need to reform the way students are able to pay back debt, and we need to put more money so that students have less debt to begin with and have to consider finance less in choosing what college they're going to go to. Um, UMass has great things going on, though. We have here, research at world-class levels. Uh, we have particular initiatives like the new dining system. This was something that I was absolutely wowed when I saw this. And it's one particular investment that the university has made uh, that is able to engage students in health, having healthier food, more sustainable food, uh, and, and the cost is actually comparable to other college meal plans. So that kind of efficient investment is something we should be pushing more and more here. I think another part of this, though, is access to college and the knowledge for high schoolers. So at Amherst High School, we have a wonderful college counseling program. Uh, Myra Ross tells every student 
everything they need to know about colleges. But I think that that's not true of every single high school, even in our community, and it's certainly not true across the state. And even when students have that system, there are many, many factors that make people not even look at college as an option or not be able to navigate the system, whether it's the application system or the financial aid system. And it doesn't enable people to easily enter what is now such an essential part of training people for the American workforce. So I, I agree with um, previous speakers, but I'd like to address also um, UMass is the largest economic generator and engine in our area, in this region, and I think it's critical that the ties with the communities that it resides in and its workforce and the students that are being educated uh, is, is really important to everybody's success. Um, I think expanding opportunities between private and public partnerships and having both significantly more public investment in the university system. I'm completely for the 50-50 plan, or, or better, uh, to get back to that for funding of, of UMass and all the community college um, state university system. But I also think we need to uh, look at addressing more of a non-traditional, like university without walls and vocational, and providing everybody an education that they desire uh, it might not strictly be the four-year degree that they're looking for, but they deserve access to any form of education that they're looking for. And the university should be able to do that. And I think one of the keys to that is the partnership with, uh, whether it's the farms in the region or the businesses or manufacturing, that we can really work harder on uh, that vocational and, and uh, non-traditional educational form. Thank you. So I was going to say, I also uh, support the progressive income tax um, constitutional amendment and uh, the so-called linear surcharge. Um, frankly, I was deeply disappointed in the Massachusetts legislature back a couple of years ago when uh, my old boss, Governor Thatcher, had proposed, with absent a constitutional amendment, um, this, a, a significant increase in, uh, in taxes that was also tied to uh, more progressive exemptions to enable uh, less of an impact on, on middle class and lower income families. So I think we, we've been there before, we've been there before on that vote. I think the fact of the matter is it can take significant organizing this fall to get through, to get that passed. And frankly, the resources that go with it are critical. I mean, recently you might have heard that in the governor's new budget, he actually uh, abandoned, his staff people said, they abandoned even an attempt to reach 50-50 on the cost of student contribution and state contribution um, that had been made previously by Bob Curra and uh, Governor Patrick. So we need to get back there, and then we need to get much further. Another effort that's been going on over the last few years, as you know, is trying to improve the quality and access and cost of our community college system and linking them better um, to our workforce boards and our uh, vocational schools so they can have seamless integration, wherever, regardless of someone's age, to get this, the skills and training they need, uh, whether they're tra transitioning or unemployed or whatever it is. Uh, and, uh, and I think that We've made a lot of progress, but it takes both money and consistent effort on the part of local leaders and state leaders to be committed to ensuring we have that kind of a system. We're not there now, and, uh, and I think we need to get there. Thank you. Now, UMass was the reason why we moved here as a, a young family with two young children. At that time, my husband was in graduate work doing graduate work, and I was employed by the university. You know, the university has done a great do good job in expanding, moving um, a satellite campus to Springfield, opening up access to more, to more communities, um, people who need to do graduate work. Um, they don't need to drive here anymore. The other issue we have with our community colleges is that our students can't access them. We don't have a direct bus from here to Holyoke. It takes an hour to get to GCC sometimes. We need to look at access. How can our students access our universities? You know, we have two private colleges in this town. We have others nearby. But you know, we have Westfield State University, Holyoke Community, 
and Greenfield Community College that our students in this region need to look at as a greater consortium other than beyond uh, the private college uh, area. Uh, yes, I agree with the millionaire's tax. Uh, access is the biggest issue. <coughs> Student loan funding, that's a federal issue. And this is where I would be beneficial uh, in being able to reach out to our Congress and our senators. I'm a member of the Democratic State Committee. I was elected by this region, the State Senate District. I have direct access to a lot of people who represent education um, and other political um, people in this country, in this state, who can provide more funding for education. I've developed a network that will be beneficial for when I lobby for UMass and our other state institutions and for our public education here. I've already developed this network by lobbying with our legislators, being on the state committee, and I will use that to my advantage to get more money for this area for education and other services. Thank you. So I, I agree with everything that's been said here, and I want to echo what Ms. McCracken said. I think the key here is opening up access. When you think in terms of education, there's the issue of financial access, and I mentioned support for getting to the 50-50 and standing, staying with that and even doing better. Uh, there was also Nass Perg, who was part of a successful campaign a few years ago to get our uh, federal legislators uh, to successfully increase the amount of Pell Grants coming in. And I think that there's merit in that. And then I think what uh, Bonnie was talking about is spot on in the sense of uh, we don't have an infrastructure that does lend itself to access uh, to the university and to the area community colleges. We can talk all we want about workforce development, but if PBTA runs in a, in a system uh, that takes an hour to an hour and a half, it's going to be very difficult for a person who needs that sort of training to get there. But as a, I'll speak to as a K through 12 educator, I've been mindful through this campaign about what K through 12 educational institutions can do provide access. And Solomon mentioned, and I'll give a shout out to the counselor at Amherst Regional. She's a wonderful person doing her job, Myra Ross. Uh, but uh, we don't have a Myra Ross in every high school, and so we have to develop some kind of systemic way of opening up access from our K-12 system into higher ed. Right now we have dual enrollment, and I think uh, um, there are some students who have the means who can do that. It used to be that the state would provide money, the state doesn't provide money. That would be a key place for the state to go back to providing money so that it's not just upper class or upper middle class students from families who can take advantage of dual enrollment. It would be great actually if the university here would extend the same offer that Amherst College offers to Amherst High School students, which is free classes. I think it would be great for the university to establish a partnership where it wasn't just Amherst, but Amherst, Granby High School, and a lot of other area high school students have access to free or low cost classes here. So it really is all about access, and it's about doing everything we can to create the infrastructure and the financing for those access points. Thank you. Okay, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much for those responses. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to collapse a, a few questions into one as we uh, we turn to K through 12 education. Here's the question: uh, In your thoughts about educational reform, K through 12, do high stakes tests or charter schools have any meaningful role in educational uh, reform, K through 12? So that's right to hear. I will go. We need some kind of test, but we should not be making high-stakes decisions based on it. That seems obvious to me. Uh, testing for research, very useful. I think if we moved MCAS to the beginning of the year and used it for teachers to guide their teaching for the year, uh, rather than for evaluating teachers and students, that would be a small step in the right direction. Uh, I think longer term, we need a better test. We need something that is actually measuring students learning holistically. 
Uh, charter schools, I like the idea of charter schools. We need to fix the funding. They take away money from our district schools. They should be completely funded by the state. There should be an absolute cap on charters. There should be no profiteering through the industry of high stakes testing um, in, in our public schools. What is happening now um, is that charter schools are taking money from the public schools and that's not right and that's, that has to be fixed. Um, I've been at the State House to lobby for a cap on charters. I was there with the Mass Massachusetts Teachers Association with Barbara Mataloni, um, with my colleagues um, from school committee, Mr. Rick Hood, and uh, our community, Max Page, and his, his daughter, who is spearheading the opt-out movement in, our, in, in Amherst. So my daughter has opted out. You heard my son has opted out today. And what we need to do is build that grassroots movement to push back and to say no more, um, that public funds belong to public schools and public education. So uh, addressing the issue of pre K through 12 testing and charter schools, I have two children that have gone. One has already graduated from the Amherst Regional School System. My other is about to. Um, having looked at this, my children are very distinct and, and different in their approaches. And what I've learned is there's not necessarily a test for everybody, not necessarily a school that fits everybody. Uh, I'm for the charter cap and for transparency and accountability. But I do think that charter schools do serve a purpose in providing an alternative. But we can't just hand them money that should have been given to the school that our, our child would have been attending. There has to be some accountability to that program. Uh, I do. I am aware of something that Stan Roseberg is putting forward. It's called the Rise Act, Reform, Innovation, and Success, and that's what it's looking at: is how to s slowly raise the cap on charter schools, understanding that they are a viable alternative for some children and some families, but it puts protocols in place where they have to uh, provide uh, financials in, in their for their schools. And they have to show uh, that they are protecting those children. Uh, there's issues of, um, uh, you know, not the best care. Uh, so I think we have to look at all the options for so that there's an option for every child. As a mother of four children, I can agree with what Sarah has just said, that you know, each of our children have their own learning style. And, um, you know, but the charter schools, I think we have to go back, and we have to revisit the legislation first before we move forward to make any decisions. I often see the charter schools as something somewhat like a magnet school or a lab school. And I think we've gotten away from what charter schools were supposed to provide. They were supposed to come up with new, innovative ideas and bring them back to our communities and teach uh, the teachers and our educators about new ways of teaching children. It's never happened. I just I don't like the way they are taking money away from our schools. And so, yes, we need to look at the funding. It's not the charter schools, it's the legislation. We need to go back to the beginning, look at the, the legislation, and figure out how we can make this work. Uh, because we need options, because not, all, not every child learns the same way. And people need options. If you live in a small community, and they need to put, educate their children in a more diverse area, population, or if they need more arts. People need options. We need to go back and make sure that everybody receives enough funding to carry out the mission of public schools. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been in the um, running dialogue on this subject uh, with um, my, my mom, who's a former teacher in the Amherst Public Schools, as well as a special ed director who recently retired. 
and friends have gone through UMass and are now teachers and proud union members, uh, teachers, um, throughout the Commonwealth. And even I remember back when the Edward Reform Bill passed in 93, and frankly, uh, it wasn't just based on experimentation in terms of coming up with new and novel ideas. There was behind it a, what I would consider an insidious and fraudulent idea that based on some sort of market competition, you'd get, you'd get charter schools and public schools fighting it out and duking it out. And if you had an innovation in a charter school, and then this other, you know, the traditional district school would adopt the technique and they'd fight and compete over customers. It was one of those idiotic ideas that frankly the Republicans were pushing back 20, 25 years ago that um, frankly we need to abandon. That's one of the core problems and flaws in the, in the logic of the, uh, of the charter law. And it's one of the reasons why we have this uh, death cage match right now going on between our district schools and charter schools. And the sad thing is, I think there is there is undoubtedly a place for innovative schools, whether they're um, within district um, schools, the Horace Mann schools, or magnet schools, or charter schools. There's undoubtedly a role for innovation. But the fact of the matter is, the law is structured in a way which creates a really perverse and unhealthy competition. And frankly, the governor's proposal for, uh, innovate, uh, for his, his legislation makes it even worse. Because in, for Amherst, which has, I think, around $2.3 million or something like that on net, uh, with 100 and roughly 70, 75 students um, between the local, the local elementary schools and the regional schools, there's a significant net outflow right now from this town. Uh, and the governor's legislation picks off uh, the, the big cities like Boston and says, oh, we're going to give you funding, more funding over a three-year period um, to reimburse you for your loss on, on funding. Um, but if you are, have under 10% of your budget from, uh, from charter school app placements um, or you're a high-performing school district, um, you'll get nothing after the first year. What that means that this, this effort, we're, the, the spike we're in right now, in my opinion, um, to rationalize our school funding uh, it, it, could get, it could get even worse instead of getting better. So this is a fight we need to take on, and it's something that, frankly, there's a broad coalition you know, of, of school committee members and superintendents and other educational professionals and activists who understand that this is, this is not working and it needs to change. And that's, frankly, on top of the fact that if you look at ordinary Chapter 70 funding and the Foundation Commission's uh, uh, report last year that talked about the inadequate uh, formulation of health care and retirement, low income and SPED um, reimbursements from the state, it's even worse than that, because that's not even part of the charter issue. And so frankly, we need to really tackle this, and frankly, we need to tackle it also, because this is about not only our funding for our schools and the quality of our schools, but also then fiscal impact on the rest of the town's budgets. So again, I, I would uh, echo much of what has been said but I think with, with the issue of charter schools, so I'm a high school teacher and I'm an MTA activist. And normally I think people, I'm a high school teacher in an area of public school, and normally people would assume that I'm opposed to charters. I would say that since ed reform uh, was passed and charter schools were established, uh, the landscape of education has changed sufficiently that there's no going back and getting rid of charter schools. So there is a role for charter schools in education. Uh, but we need to distinguish between Commonwealth Charter Schools and Horace Mann Charter Schools. In the case of Commonwealth Charter Schools, we have private entities taking public money without having to abide by uh, the same rules, the same governance rules that uh, regular traditional public schools have to abide by. In the case of Horace Mann, it, I think, is what we need to head toward. Uh, we need to strive more for uh, Horace Mann charter schools, which are in district, in public school district, charter schools that allow some flexibility, some innovation. Uh, they still allow governance, traditional uh, public school governance. Uh, they allow for all of the other regulations about following meet, open meeting law, financial disclosure, transparency. And that's where we need to put our emphasis. If I could just speak really quickly, I'm sorry, I was, uh, the, about the issue of high stakes testing. So as a public school teacher, I can tell you every test is a high stakes test. And one of my students back there would probably second that, right, Lily? <laughs> so, uh, so is there a role for high stakes testing? There's a role for testing uh, to, for educational professionals 
professionals to sit down and assess the skill acquisition that our students in our district have over time. Uh, what there isn't a role for is using those test results to punish school districts in terms of their funding, in terms of their governance, and in state.